So as Peter said, it's, it's important to talk about different genres sometimes, you know, to actually take a deep dive look at different genres. And certainly, um, I know in my reporting um, career, we've been hearing a lot about drama, a lot about drama, peak drama, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's nice to go to nonfiction, right, and talk about what's going on in that space. And what I like about this panel is that we're going to talk about um, how the production, the creative part, the distribution, the marketing, how that is being changed, or maybe not so changed, by some of the new uh, commissioners that are out there, uh, you know, namely Netflix, Amazon, folks like that, um, what the new platforms are doing to nonfiction, for example, YouTube, other platforms, and also how the, you know, the, what I would call the legacy media players, broadcasters, are doing in terms of making sure they stay in the game. Um, what I think is also interesting is, Peter mentioned technologies. And I've always felt that nonfiction tends to adapt new technologies sometimes first. I mean, if I think about some of the, um, the BBC Attenborough, you know, nature documentaries, I mean, they use all this kind of cool cameras and all that kind of stuff. So it, in some ways, uh, nonfiction adopts technology much faster than some of the fiction genres. So I'm hoping that we're gonna surface some of that stuff in this panel. So we've got, um, we've got three people to help us surface all of this very interesting stuff. In the middle, in this wonderful um, red dress, we have Esther von Messel. She is CEO at First Hand Films. It's based in Zurich. Um, before setting up her own company in the late 1990s, Esther had been a producer and a distributor, working as head of distribution for Warner Brothers Israel. She worked for an independent company in Zurich. First Hand Films today, she tells me, represents about, I think it's 300 about hand-picked films and 200 producers from all over the world. And she also acts as an executive producer for selective, selected projects. And certainly that's another theme that I've seen is that distributors, if they're smart and savvy, are also becoming executive producers. And that's something I think Esther will tell us a little bit more about. Um, we've also got um, Christian Betts, who's over here. Christian is the CEO of Gebrüder Betts Film Production. How did I do with that? Yeah, perfect. Close, okay. We had to be brothers. <laughs> um, Christian and his production company um, focus on topics related to politics, society, culture. They've won numerous awards, um, Cinema for Peace Award, an Oscar nomination. The company uh, complements its cinematic uh, content like The Cleaners, which we're going to see a clip of. Um, with also cross-media mm -hmm. formats. He's done something called The Master's Vision, which is a VR series. He's done television series, including The Art of Museums. So <laughs> Christian has done, I was, you know, sort of across the piece, as we say in, in Britain, in terms of the kind of things he does. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Marcus Vetter. Um, Marcus is a director, producer, commissioning editor. Um, Marcus's films have received a lot of attention at national and international film festi festivals. They've won numerous awards, including, I think it's three Adolf Grimm Awards. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, the German Oscar, if you don't know, um, and the German Academy Award. Among his portfolio films are The Tunnel, which I think was from 1999. Yeah. Um, My Father the Turk, uh, Heart of Jenin, is that how you say it? Jenin? Heart of Jenin. Uh, Jenin. Uh, which is 2008, and Killing for Love, 2017, which we're also going to we're going to look at yeah. deep dive into that a little bit more. So, Marcus, let, let's start with you, um, and talk about. You know, we hear that making nonfiction is kind of a passion, and it is a passion, um, but it also can be really important in terms of society and changing minds and getting people to think in different ways. So. Talk to me a little bit about your opinion about, um, you know, have you started to see more appetite for that kind of passion project that you do, that, those kind of films that really say something about politics and society and emotion? Are you starting to see more appetite out there for your films? Oh, I think, not for my films. I think um, we never had a situation where there's so many incredible films out there. Mm -hmm. I mean... And it's, it's a little bit bizarre because the films are so good and still people are not embracing them because mm. they don't know. I think they just don't know that they're so good. So 10 years ago, I think there wasn't so, so many good films around. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to ITFA, um, to the documentary film festival in Amsterdam, I mean, you're just amazed about the production value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But 
we had ups and downs in, in cinemas and um, like 10 years ago when there were not so many films in cinema, they yeah. worked well, but now yeah. the audience dropped again and we don't know why. But I think it's, 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 it's a matter of time until you really, until everybody knows that these films are so incredible because they're better than fiction, mm. much better than fiction yeah. very often. <laughs> Truth is always better than fiction, they say. So are you seeing, are you getting, I mean, are you talking to Netflix or do you get involved in all that or is that some, the other part of the, your brain? You're basically making the, the content and... No, I, I mean, I was asked by Netflix as well to, to, to work with them. I mean, Christian is right now working with Netflix. Mm -hmm. I'm rather working with the ARD because they are just they are just there from the very beginning. I mean, you can better work with them. I think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Netflix maybe you maybe you can't reach them or they want something special because they want mm. something which is working at the market. And right. I think films you cannot you, you you are not able to know if you will be successful with a film. I mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. that's not how I'm selecting a film. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm selecting a film because I think it's a must film or because it's a sign of a time. Um, As opposed to Netflix saying you're going to fill an algorithm need for me or something. Yeah, exactly. Okay, right. And I think that's, that's, not, that's not the way I, I could do a film. Um, okay. Could make a film. Let's talk about, because I know you've got two clips, um, Killing for Love. Talk us into that. Why are you showing us this? This, we've got the promo first, which will kind of explain the film. Should we run that, or do you want to talk no, about I'm, it? No, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about yeah. it. Um, it's, it's interesting because it's actually not the... <coughs> it's me? It's you, yeah. <laughs> I was <Ooh>. doing... Subtle. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I was doing a film about <laughs> hunger, uh -huh. and I was working with a journalist from the Süddeutsche Zeitung together. Yeah. And um, she was always talking to me about a person... Uh, ab about, uh, about Jens Söring, um, who was in prison back then since 24 years. Wow. And, um, and he, he fell in love with um, a girl when he was young, when he was 18. His father was an ambassador, a German ambassador in, in the mm -hmm. US. And it was his first love. Um, they were together for three months. She was two years older. She, she, she looked very pretty. And then suddenly one night she killed her parents. And because he was so much in love with her and because he knew that um, she probably was abused by her mother, mm. he took the blame for her. And then they were running away and they were running around the globe and they were finally caught um, in England. Mm -hmm. And he ended up um, taking the blame and then he ended up in prison. Okay. And she was so overwhelmed always when she was talking about this guy that finally we, we met him in prison three years later. She asked me if I would produce that film. It's not a film I would normally produce because I was missing in the beginning what I need in a film, the political... Um, mm. um, zeitgeist. Or yeah, zeitgeist. Mm. But w when I made the film, it came to me, the political side, guys, because it was about the American justice system. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, so we can maybe yeah. watch the trailer and then we'll, we'll talk more about it. Okay, good. Let's watch the trailer. Killing for Love. Dear Liz, I love you. Je t'aime. Ich liebe dich. Promise me, Jens, whatever it takes now. Promise me you will not let me ruin your life. I've seriously fucked up on mine. Do you state that and cut her on the left side of her neck just as you'd cut Mr. Hasem? Mrs. Hasem started screaming and she was holding her neck like this. Please, my darling Jens, you won't leave me to take the rap alone. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder. Hey, Jens, you still say you're innocent? Ich habe mein Leben zerstört, weil ich dachte, dass es sich um Liebe drehte. Aber die Liebe gab es nicht. Is Elizabeth Hasten a beautiful and intelligent murderer or the victim of an obsessive relationship with a cold-blooded killer? 
There's no way this little boy could have done that kind of damage to somebody. I think somebody else is involved in this murder. And this is a way to check and see. I brought all the files in, read all the police reports, and I said, this man is innocent. We've got the wrong man. This man didn't do it. He was so possessed over that girl, she did nothing but use the boy in order to get to her parents. Sweetie Pie, I can't wait to get you all to myself. I want to sit on your lap and feel your finger. Dear Sweetie, I love you so very much. Forever yours, Jens. Was vor mir war, eine schöne junge Frau, die ich schrecklich liebte und die in Todesgefahr war. Das war es, was mir durch den Kopf ging. It is a far, far better thing I do than I've ever done. So he took the rap, and you distributed this as a theatrical film, yeah. yes? But then you also moved into other versions, right? So talk us through that. What was the, the theatrical film came out first, and then you wanted to serialize it, or how does that work creatively for? Yeah, it was like that, that suddenly I realized, because normally you are doing screening mm. when you have a rough cut, mm. and normally it's like that, that the film cannot be much longer than 120 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. You will always end up with 110 minutes or 100 minutes because your, your <clears throat> a, a, a film must be really very good in order to have more than 120 minutes. But here we had screenings because it's a, it's a, um, it's a crime story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm where we had 150, 160, 170 minutes and the people were still there and um, mm. they could still follow the, the movie. And, um, and that's because it's crime, it's about crime because that's mm -hmm. what, what interests us. And um, that's why we were suddenly editing a 170 minute version and then the BBC came in order to watch a rough cut and I, I didn't know um, what to do so I showed um, Nick Fraser a 170 minute rough cut and. <laughs> And then he said, okay, I, I, I don't want to miss any scene out of that film. And then we, we said, okay, we, we planned to do a serial. Uh -huh. So we were versioning the film. And, um, and this versioning of, of a film, that led to a lot of things. Because out of 180 minutes, you can make 6 times 30, right. 4 times 45, right. 3 times 60, 2 times 90. That's what we did. And that gave you a lot more options for how you distributed it. Yeah, who because could we, buy were, it. we were really selling every version of that film. Okay. I mean, Sweden and Finland, they were uh, mm -hmm. buying the, the, the three times 60, it's other buying, mm -hmm. were buying the two times 90, then AMC um, um, was buying the, the six times 30. Right. And so you, you suddenly end up much better because it was the first film where we made money with um, Good. just because of the versioning so but then you had to you have to have a topic which which works that mm -hmm. way yes and crime is one of these topics because obviously um, people are just fascinated when they don't know what's happening when they don't know um, if he's guilty or not and 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 you could find easily cliffhangers for that um, way of producing. And that's how we were able to version it. So we've got a cliffhanger, I think. Yeah. So can we play that now? Yeah, we could yeah? play that. Let's play that now. This is quite, quite a long. It's about four minutes. Your Honor, I asked the defendant what his position was, his position, as far as what happened. And Your Honor, he maintained the position throughout, and his position was that he killed Derek and Nancy Hasem, and he admitted that. Your Honor, did crossing the ocean suddenly cause this change in position? He is taking inconsistent positions. His attorneys have taken inconsistent positions. And I feel, Your Honor, that that's improper. That you cannot take a position earlier in a legal proceeding and then later take one that it's entirely different. That, to me, is barred by the code of ethics. It's <coughs> not proper and it's not honest. Of October 4, 1986, that you state that there came a point when you became angry that you stood up, Mr. Hasem pushed you back into the corner, and that you bumped your head. That's what I said here, yes. That you grabbed a knife, and that you came around behind. I asked him, I said, yeah, let's talk about the knife. When? Tell me about the knife. Well, I'm not going to talk about the knife. 
This was in his last interview. I said, why won't you talk about the knife? He said, because if I tell you that I took a knife there, that shows premeditation on my part. I don't want to talk about a knife. Now, Yen's being a Jefferson scholar, why would you make a statement like that? I, 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 mean, I mean, that is so incriminating, but he didn't want to talk about that, but yet he's smarter than the average bear. You know, it, it's very well known that people have confessed to, to crimes that they didn't commit. Last I remember, I was at the door to the living room. I saw her going to the kitchen with both hands at her neck. Mr. Hasem was still screaming. He tried to get up after probably having slipped on the blood. That is about the last that I can clearly remember. After that, I left the house towards the car. I can only remember Mr. Hasem as he was lying on the floor, half in the dining and half in the living room. The legs of Mr. Hasem were in the living room and the upper part of Mrs. Hasem was in the kitchen. My clothes were very bloodstained and I wanted to throw them away. On the way to the rubbish container, I hit a little dog which ran across the road. He said, by the way, investigator Gardner, he said, did y'all find a dog that was laying on the side of the road there or dead? And I'm going, wait a minute, say that again. And he asked me again, he said, did you find a dog that was laying on the side of the road dead? And I said, no. I said, Jens, I said, what, what, why are you asking? He said, well, he said, that night when I left the scene, when I, when I left the house the first time going to the dumpster, he said, I thought a dog ran out in front of me, and I thought I hit it. And he said, I was afraid I'd killed it. And he said, when I came back to the house, I didn't see it. And he said, I was just wondering if y'all ever found it. And I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you just sat here and told me that you've basically cut two people's heads off, and you've brutally murdered two people, and you're worried about a dog. And he looked at me just like I'm looking at you now, and he said, that dog never did anything to me. Now, why would a man that's a fabricating a story interject that? Because that's the truth. Jens was telling the absolute truth when he was talking about that dog. He killed that dog, but that dog had never done anything to him, unlike the Hastings. That's just, that's one of the many pieces to the puzzle that convicted Jens Orr. It gives you enough stuff, and you're just brought into it. Um, okay, so that and that worked for you. So that's that's a really a good positive story. As you say, it's the only film you've, that you've made money on just right away because you had the versioning. Yeah. Right. So let me just let me just jump to Christian now. So Christian, what are you seeing? I mean, when you're pulling the money and the talent together, has that gotten easier or more difficult with these new platforms? I mean. We talked a little bit about Netflix. I mean, a lot of people say to me, oh, there's lots of money sloshing around in the system. Is that an experience that you're having? I know that you've just done The Cleaners, which I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, premiered at Sundance in January. I think it debuted this week in the US on PBS, Monday night. Do you know yeah. how it did yet? Did it get, you don't know yet, no, okay? No, I don't know. Um, and it's also on PBS.org, I think, streaming platform for a couple of weeks. Um, so talk, you know, talk, talk me through that. Are you starting to see different dynamics, I guess, in the financing and production of, of films? Um, yeah, we have a completely new, new situation now with, with these new players, and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of dynamic in, in our market, uh, not only in terms of, of money, so it's also about storytelling, and, and, um, and you reach different kind of audiences right now. Um, like, like Marcus said, you know, that it makes in this day's sense to make more versioning, um, to get on different kind of platforms, mm -hmm. to reach different kind of audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't have anymore this two players, you know, theatrical and TV. So though there's, a, there's a new player who's increasingly starting, you know, not only to be something for the really, really youngsters, um, it, it goes, so in other words, not just YouTube, but like you've got Netflix, yeah, yeah, you've got yeah, Amazon. Yeah, yeah, they're actually yeah. they're actually commissioning, you know, real content, premium content. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so for example, Apple now started. You know, mm -hmm. they commissioned five series uh, two weeks ago, nonfiction series. Um, uh, Facebook is starting. Yeah, they they commissioned nonfiction series. So they probably it, wouldn't have commissioned the cleaners though, right? Not really. I no, think the cleaners, so. by the way, is about Facebook and social media, right? 
Yeah, so, maybe we show the clip and then I could then you tell you a little about bit that. about my experience with financing the cleaners because this is one of the example, examples where we had an offer of Netflix mm -hmm. on, on the table as well yeah. and we had the public broadcaster system so oh. and to see how this could work together or not. Okay, so you want to yeah, see the Yeah, yeah, maybe it's better. So let's, let's, get an impression. let's roll the cleaners. What are we talking about here? Yeah. Delete. Yeah. Ignore. Ignore. Did it. Did it. Ignore. Ignore. Delete. Companies decide what can stay up and what must be taken down. Delete. Outsourcing should be disturbing to people in democratic societies. There are tens of thousands doing this work. All of it's done in secret. They need to be anonymous because we have a contract sign in. Ignore. Our decisions will impact what two billion people are thinking. If you commit one mistake, it could trigger war. Delete. I've seen hundreds of beddings. Ignore. Delete. Ignore. Delete. Delete. Ignore. Delete. Delete. Ignore. Delete. Delete. Ignore. Ignore. Delete. 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 The danger is that we might lose democracy because we're willing to give it up. Wow. <laughs> Doc. <laughs> a, a film for our times. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, our times. Yeah, that, that feeling had we all the time when we producing it and, and we had the time and the neck. Uh, because when we started this uh, production, many commissioning editors, of, for example, said, I don't care about Facebook, you know, I'm not on Facebook. So, <laughs> and anyway, um, um, but this is an example, you know, we, we had very fast, we had one, one partner in, on place like Arte, you know, they stepped in, jumped in, even they didn't know where to, the story will end, and we had them, and, and I pitched it. I only knew that in Manila there's a huge shadow industry of content moderation, um, but I didn't know if you get really access to to to, to people, characters there. And you did. You got incredible access. Yeah, yeah. and and we had two, <coughs> two youngsters as uh, debut um, directors. They mm -hmm. never did wow. a film before, mm -hmm. even three minutes, a single film. They they studied theater play, you know. Mm -hmm. they, just came out of the school. So it's, it's not so easy to sell. But, but um, we, then we started the production and we, 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 we did the first um, research and, and teaser and, and so on. And then uh, Netflix came aware of this and, and said, listen, we want to do that. Uh, we want to be part of that. And I said, great. oh, great, mm. great, fucking great. You could be part of that. But <laughs> then the but came and they said, no, we want to be the only one. So I was in kind of conflict of interests now. Mm. So because um, you couldn't go back to Arte and say sorry, you're out. Yeah. Mm. Honestly, I was thinking about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we did a kind of stress test <laughs> in our company. <laughs> how expensive should be the film <laughs> that we independent for the next two, three years? Oh, um, but uh, but um, I have you know a lot of employees, and then so uh, so sort of, okay, it's quite expensive. Um, yeah, but it was very difficult and then um, to decide where to go because you have that one player who's saying, I pay the bill, and, and you have a player who's saying, you know, I'm with 10% of it. Oh, oh, I'm with 10% yeah. I'm in. So fine. So yeah, That's I have when to you find have to the other 90%. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> so. you have to put more financing together, <laughs> right? So that's what you decided to do, go out and do more financing, or did you just take the risk personally on your company? Um, um, I took the risk on my company, so, mm. so we, we, because even, you know, it's quite complicated. Our system in, in with the public broadcasters and, and with the film funds, it, it's very out of the old times. Mm. Uh, um, the, the, the biggest challenge is um, that they want really to be secure what they get mm -hmm. in terms of, in, in, especially in Germany, and I'm doing a lot of international projects, uh, uh, co-productions. In Germany, they want to have, they want to read a book really like, like a fiction book, you know? They want to know where it starts and where it ends. Oh. And, and, uh, and also uh, the calculation, you know? Uh, you have to calculate that. 
But if you, when you start this kind of productions, you never know where it ends and what it costs. Yeah. Okay. So this. Um, this was the main main challenge in that, and so so we we stick then said okay let's make it the traditional way, um, and and we 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 work with the European Film Fund, so um, uh, EU media program for development. We applied that. Um, we we involved um, co-production partners like BBC, NHK. Um, PBS. Name it, PBS. Yeah, they they came really late. They so, came so late. Okay. Really, really late. Um, so you so did cover your costs in the end, yes. So uh, not when the film was finished. So we had a um, okay. because uh, what, what I my my strategy was to make the film without in North America financing, and 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 uh, to say okay, let's we have to get this film on a big US festival, mm -hmm. um, and it worked out. So we had the world premiere at Sundance, Sundance Film Festival. Right. Mm -hmm. And at Sundance, uh, <laughs> Sundance Film Festival, the years before, there were crazy numbers. We, Netflix was paying, yeah, you know, they were for writing checks, huge checks, huge, huge. What's well, three and a half, four and a half, you know, up to name <laughs> it. So, so and this was our, our, you know, goal. And we thought, okay, let's let's finance this through Europe and then sell it mm. to the North America market. So we, this market was free. Uh, we had the world premiere there. We had the sales agent there who said, you know, everybody wants to see this film, you know, we got huge press, um, we had a lot of secret screenings, you know, how would you do that, you know, to play with everybody. <laughs> so everybody was excited and thought he's the only one to see it and whatever. <laughs> so and he said, okay, start, everything starts on Friday, on Tuesday you could open up the champagne. So, and we were so, oh, will it be three million, will it be four million, so maybe seven million. <laughs> And the result, make it short, a long story short, nothing. Happened. Wow. So Netflix was for the very first time on the market saying, you know, we're buying nothing. Okay. Amazon had problems with erasement problems and mm. huge management, so they were without a head there. So uh, um, the whole market was shaking, you know. And this shows how, how, how fast this, this market is developing and, and, um, and it's, it's a lot of dynamics in it. So, right, okay. Um, so that's an interesting story. So Esther, if I can come to you, we've basically heard two stories where it's like, oh, the new platforms are out there, but they're hard to work with. So give us your view. You're a distributor. You've been in this game for, what, 20 plus years. You, you, know, you represent lots of different companies, all nonfiction, right? So give us your view on this. Are the dynamics changing? Is there a big pot of money from the Netflixes and the whatevers of the world, or is it really not that way? I think we we feel we in the nonfiction business we feel something that the others might not feel yet because none of us is in this business for the money, but the platforms are only about money, and that's actually everything I have to say. It will show you that if you work with public broadcasters that are funded by the state because the state believes it's important to have a voice, and if you're funded by subsidies as my colleagues are, and I'm not, um, then you're actually on the opposite end of what on-demand means. Mm. It means that you can make the films that you believe have to be made, mm. as Marcus advocated so passionately, yeah. which I think is really important. So video on-demand is on-demand. It means that we're only showing people what they want to see Anyway, so if we only do what people already want, then nobody will invent this one because <laughs> it doesn't exist because 10 years ago we didn't know we could want it. Um, and it's a big gap. I have not one producer who comes to me that I start working with who doesn't say, sell my film to Netflix. <laughs> I speak to Netflix and all of them every week or every month or every three weeks or whatever makes sense for them. And I visit them and I talk to them. And, I'm, and there is no continuity. There is no partner to rely on. Christian could have sold um, the cleaners to Netflix and he would have never done business anymore with all his partners that he's worked with for 20 years because mm -hmm. that's how it works these days. So it's a balance. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that we missed the train 10, 15 years ago when we said reality TV is not for us because it's not creative documentary. I think we should have made smart reality TV then we would be closer today to those platforms. Mm -hmm. With the documentaries as we've made them, 
even if we start versioning them, even if we start realizing that we need to translate them into different languages formally, uh, we still have a lot to learn. Mm. Um, and it's a very interesting process, but there's no clean cut answer. But what I take away from here, from having sat here through sessions this whole day, is that nobody's talking about content. All the lecture, everything was about the tech possibilities, and those are great. I'm married to a genetic engineer. I know <laughs> what those discussions are like. Mm -hmm. Whatever we can do, yes, but. And so we're on that side where we actually want to get stories seen and stories told, and how much the, the technological development, to just bring it a little bit back to this conference, mm. has, has anything to do with that. Right now, I think very little, mm. and I think it's really, really hard to use those new possibilities to earn money. We can use them all the time, but mm -mm. not commercially interesting. In terms of the distribution platforms, yes. Like, okay, yeah. But, but because obviously think, other kinds of tech do help, like you of know, course, you know, I don't know, specialist cameras and no, no, like everything's that. become so much easier. Yeah, um, but. Uh, I th I believe that an audience does not want to curate when they're mm -hmm. starting to consume stuff in the evening. I believe that nonfiction is so much more interesting than fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that we will have to rethink our attitude to content and to curation of content for the broad masses. And that's also the tendencies that I get from YouTube, from Netflix, from all those people that are thinking about maybe we should have like theme channeled parts of Netflix and then maybe there, there should be like a <laughs> yeah. time kind of line to show things. And then I'm like, wow, but then you're back like to broadcasting. broadcasting right? It's, you know, it's so interesting. We had a, a session last year where we had this, I think I talked to you about it, um, Little Dot Studios mm -hmm. and Andy Taylor, he's in the UK and he, he had decided he was going to try to create short form content and, and it wasn't really working because he couldn't monetize it. So then he ended up sort of basically licensing lots of really good documentaries, lots of it archive stuff, put it on a YouTube channel specifically for nonfiction, right? And he's getting a huge amount of traffic and earning a bit of money because, of course, there's advertising on it. So there is appetite out there. It's just a question of how do you actually curate it, find it, figure out how to do that. Um, do you want to show your show reel, by the way? I didn't let you do that. Would you yeah, like to? I mean, yeah. I think that the word documentary, I hope, is, is it actually? No, it's not, you know, it's not the name of our panel. I think no. it's really a brand killer. I think if you ask anybody, do you want to see a documentary? <laughs> Nobody will say yes. I don't <laughs> believe anybody who says yes. Um, I think if you want to, I think fiction is for sissies, but you're also allowed to be a sissy <laughs> every now and then. <laughs> but I think if you're talking about true stories and the real stuff, you know, then I think you can get the people. And <clears throat> I was invited to do a lecture in the MIP two years ago, and I got paid handsomely for that, and everything was covered. So I said, let's make a show reel for the first time, and by then, 18 years of running a company. <laughs> So, so I hired an editor and, and, and I sat him down and I was like, make, make a showreel of my company. And he looked at me and was like, that's 300 films. I said, yeah, you just make a showreel. And he came back with a three minute talking heads, old white dudes explaining the world. Yes, they're also in my films, but come on, I said, that's not what I stand for. So let me show you what the showreel became. Okay, oh, yeah. let's show the showreel. Thank you. <laughs> Damn line, say Tony. I don't give a shit what the line is. Hide the camera while someone is here. Some dead in Some. 
Die wird er wie Jung Bär wird er. Nettere? Ja. Ja, Unico. Great. Great. Thank you. So what's interesting about that is you really, there's a lot of diversity in that. There's, you know, there's women, there's people that aren't white, you know, there's, I mean, it's a diverse group. So do you think that's one of the issues? I mean, we're talking, we have to talk about, we have to reflect real life, real life, right? I mean, you know, you were, you're reflecting, you're looking at a real life crime. You're, you're, you were looking at the cleaners, you're looking at a real life problem with how we're dealing with, you know, social media and cleaning it up or not. I mean, it's about reflecting the real world. It, there should be an appetite for that. I think there is. A, a friend of mine was running a, a company in New York uh, called Women Make Movies, where they work with a female director's film. She tells me that her programming is viewed as niche and specialist. I'm like, what do you mean niche? We're 52% of the population. What's niche about that? Mm. I've, I've, there's a lot of things that you have to do in documentary distribution where you have to be just completely professional because it's so we're we're dealing with so many difficult people and 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 so many feelings and it's always about emotions right so it's so important to do it right but at the end of the day my decision to handle a film or not handle a film or executive produce it or not is just based on passion and I will not deal with stories that I don't care about. And like, I don't drink cappuccino anymore because I've kind of run out of hunger for foam milk. Like 10 years ago, I suddenly had this, okay, that was it, enough foam milk for this time. <laughs> now I'm 53 years old and I don't want to see stories about all white men anymore. Hmm. I'm sorry for those in the room. I want to see you guys. But, <laughs> and there's always exceptions, of course, but we're so hungry to find our own realities out there, and they're diverse, and they're inclusive, and they're different, and they're new, and they're innovative, which is why we cannot just ask the market what they want. That's, if, if it had been like that, I would have stayed with Warner Brothers mm. 30 years ago. I mean, that was super interesting. I learned everything that you need to learn about the majors. They really do their homework. They really know from audience. Mm. They did that 30 years ago. They would read all the newspapers that appeared in that country every month, just to get an image of it. I said, but you can't understand the language. She said, no, 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 but I can see where the ads are and where the competitor puts their ads. I mean, okay, this is pre-digital, but data has always been really important, but if we rely only on what the data tells mm -hmm. us, then the question is, who's translating that for us? Like an algorithm is just a computer program. Yeah. It has to be written by somebody. Who writes the computer programs? Young white guys, mostly? You're all aware of this uh, facial recognition software glitch, like a few years back, where a black woman was tagged as a gorilla by Google. Yeah. Yeah. Let me come back to the middle-aged white men who we love. On our <laughs> whom we love, <laughs> whom we love, um, and adore. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, yes, yes, and, so Kristen, talk, talk me through, because I want to get to this last clip and then we're going to open to the audience. Um, you guys are working together on something, right? You're the director uh, and you're the producer, yes. Talk, talk us through that, Christian. Tell us, tell us how this came up. This is also, again, this is one of these important stories that it, it sort of brings up. I mean, I don't know if you went into it when you were going to do something about Davos, the World Economic Forum, thinking that, <coughs> you, ooh, thinking that you would have Trump. But you know, talk, talk, talk us through this, this piece, because this is also kind of an important piece for our times. Yeah, it's also something, you know, what came out of passion and, and also the, not only passion and the brain, uh, the brain asked, uh, you know, how the world is working, this, this globalization on, on politics and we have this big, you know, uh, 
uh, challenges like like climate change, you know, the rich getting more rich and then the poor getting more poor and and and, uh, and then we have now these societies, these 50 50 percent societies around uh, the globe, and and um, um, we are asking ourselves, you know. Um, Who's organizing this shit <laughs> these days? You know, yeah. uh, is there somebody? Um, and so we we came up to to Davos uh, or to the World Economic Forum, the headquarters in Geneva, and there was only one event. Everybody knows, but but they're doing a lot of events yeah. worldwide. Um, and we worked um, on on the access to get access um, to the World Economic Forum because it's a closed shop. Yeah. Um, of uh, yeah, a lot of, of course, old white men, um, but in the World Economic Forum, the employees, they already have this gender 50-50 anyway. So we, um, so we, 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 we dived into it and, and, um, and um, yeah, it took us four years, four and a half years to get the access and, um, and so to answer easy? one question, yeah. you know, okay. uh, could we believe them or not? Because they... Could we believe them? They're they, they, oh, they okay. saying, you know, um, right. we want uh, mm -hmm. the founder, Klaus Schwab, you know, yeah. uh, founded it 50 years ago, said, you know, I want to make the world better with the people who has the power. Hmm. So, um, and, and there we started with this okay. question. And, and um, yeah, and, and Marcos, we've already wanna, started. Um, do you want to say something now about this? I mean, from yeah, the director I mean, point of view? I wanted to do actually a film which is not that complicated mm. and complex <laughs> because it's much easier to do a film. I made a film about uh, a Palestinian father who, mm. whose son was shot down by the Israeli army and yep. then he decided to donate his son's organs to Israeli children. Mm. That was a, a film which was um, heartbreaking somehow. Yes, yes. And this is a film which is so complex mm. but this is a sign of a time mm. and you cannot decide um, whether it's a warm-hearted film or wh whether it's a it's an important film this is an important film mm. and it's so hard so um, it took me like nine months to try to open up this Klaus Schwab to decide whether he has a vision because mm -hmm. Um, for me, he needed to have a vision because mm. otherwise it, it wouldn't be interesting yeah, for me. Exactly. And when I when I understood that he had, if he a was vision, a hollow suit, that yeah, would not be good. Why do a film about him? And mm. suddenly I, I discovered that in the 70s, 1970, he had this vision: if you would gather um, the the most powerful people mm -hmm. and talk with them about ethics, mm -hmm. if they could make the world a better world. That was, was his idea, and I think he believed in that idea, but obvi obviously it didn't work out. Yeah. So where, 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 what was the problem? Yeah. Or, or is it different that it worked out? Right, so that's really what the film's yeah, about. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, and, and, and right now we, we have this elite problem that people are voting out the elite, the politicians, because they don't believe anymore mm -hmm. in politicians mm -hmm. and in the elite. And is so that actually, the right way? So it's, it's actually a good moment to be doing yeah, this. Yeah, it's a very good to moment. Be honest. That's okay. why it's so important. Should we look at the clip now? Yeah, yeah. We can. Let's look at the clip. And this <laughs> is really work in progress. We never showed that to anybody. So yeah. this is a world so. premiere, <laughs> right? No, but it's really work in progress. You know, we we sitting. You know, we we did some Just shooting. Just yesterday, we, we we wanted to throw out the music, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. and a lot. Of All right, let's let's roll the clip. So, when is this going to be out? Um, when is, is um, in January 2020? 2020. Goodness. Okay. Yeah. So you're still are you still shooting or are you in editing now? Yeah, we are. Shooting. We are still shooting, and then right. at the same time we are mm -hmm. editing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to open up to you all because um, we've got 10 minutes left. We, we can come back and talk if you, no one has any questions. But you've just seen some very interesting interesting things. Does anyone have a question for these uh, non-fiction folk? No? Come on. How was it filming Donald Trump? Did you actually film some of that stuff? I mean, do you actually... Oh, yeah, we did. How was that? Fake was news. <laughs> Fake, Fake news. news was amazing. I mean, he was really like he was. And it was so interesting because there were sitting like 20 of the mo most biggest CEOs of the biggest companies, and they were just um, 
licking his ass. I yeah, mean, um, falling all over him. One hmm. after the other. It was really interesting how politics works and how, how, mm. how they really wanted to, um, mm. to get him on, his side, on, on their side. Yeah. It was very interesting. Wow. Um, I think it's so important you're making this. I really think, I mean, I'm always interested in these behind the scenes stories of politicians. And mm. I had the luck to see that scene. And it's just, it's haunting me in my nightmares. It's, you have, <laughs> you have uh, a lot of guys around a table and mm -hmm. everyone is kind of saying how much he invests in the US. Yeah, wow. And Trump, the more they give, the, the more he's like, yeah, cool, great. And it's just, it's like the, your worst nightmare. And that's how they run the world. Hmm. And you, it's just yeah, unfathomable. Peter, do you have a question? I have a question for Christian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm doing documentaries for 20 years as a production manager. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really passionate of this. Um, and the key question for me through all these years is how to access distribution, how to access the audience. I know that you were experimenting a lot with technology in the last years, VR, um, collaborative tools like um, social media for one of these, uh, searching for painting films, I, I don't know the, mm, the name. The WhatsApp, yeah. Yeah. What is your experience with that? Um, is it is it giving you a better access or how much is technology? I mean, we, we heard a lot of storytelling, of course, and this is the basis. But um, is, it, is it bringing you a bit forward to be a part of that technology? I think, um, yeah, we, we're doing a lot of experiments there um, to get a better understanding um, of our audience and, and distribution and also um, for storytelling. And um, unfortunately, there are not enough platforms where you could do that, so, so um, experience. Well, well, your question refers to, to a film where we worked with WhatsApp groups. So it was uh, searching for, for painting, um, it's a Holocaust story, so mm. uh, whatever, so out of the 30s. Um, and um, a family member, he was a kid, is remembering when the Gestapo came and, and, and brought his father. Um, into uh, Dachau, um, the mother went out of the, uh, the day after, the mother went, went out of uh, the flat and, 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 and took two paintings, mm -hmm. uh, came out, came, came back without the paintings in the evening, mm. and, and, uh, but with her, um, uh, uh, with the father. Okay. So got a father back. So, uh, and this was a miracle, and then the mother died, and then uh, the father as well, and then and, and, um, nobody could really remember what, what's happened with the painting. To the two paintings, so, right. you know? Obviously, then, they were so, bribed to get the yeah. father's life, yeah. Okay. yeah. And what, what we did, that's a kind of experiment, um, we said, okay, come on, this is an interesting question. Uh, maybe we could do a history film, you know, about these times, not from above, let's say this and this happened, this and this time. Um, let's make an interactive format out of mm -hmm. it. And, and uh, we put up this question, what happened to this painting? Where is it? Um, to the audience. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we opened up WhatsApp groups and we did mm -hmm. a radio station. We did a collaboration mm -hmm. with different uh, print uh, newspapers um, with, with big radio stations and and set up this question, you know, this this story and what happened. So and we open up. We said, hey, here's a WhatsApp group. Be part of that. If you have an idea, you know, they lived in, in Munich at this place and yeah, they yeah. were a huge art gallery. Right. They were the Gestapo, you know. Uh -huh. um, they were uh, the embassy of, of Switzerland, you know. What might she did, you know? Um, do we have any hints? And mm. we will follow these hints. And mm. we follow these hints and, and uh, filmed these hints, you know, with a group of young journalists. And this was amazing, amazing. We, we opened up so many WhatsApp, WhatsApp groups um, because we, it started then, firstly with the youngsters, then we had some experts in it, you know, mm. we tried mm. to discover what kind of painting was that, who was the painter, you know, what happened to him. Um, so, um, through this what apps what apps groups and the questions and and the, and the hints meeting people we we told the story of 33 hmm. and 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 german history hmm. um in in a 
pretty new way. And yeah. it's through this filming video, we did also um, a radio 10 piece show. So it was also serious talk, storytelling. Every week, they were, or every two weeks, they were a new piece on, on, um, on the radio station. So it was almost like it spun off other projects. It's almost like you had the, the film, so to speak, but then you had the radio show, the sort of like different things. It was kind of like a franchise operation. You were doing other kinds of projects related to it. Yeah, as well, it was a kind of, I don't know, you could cross media or whatever, or yeah, yeah. trans media. So we were on different medias and... Um, so did that end up being lucrative in the end, or was it just Did a, you find the painting? Did you find the painting, yeah, the yes. two paintings? Cool. You found both of them? We find, yeah, we find the paintings. Really? And then the, the story behind that. But this was not the goal, That's you cool. know, the goal was <laughs> yeah, that, that we, we had in the end uh, uh, a strong documentary uh -huh. uh, with up and downs, you know. We, we had, uh, I don't know, so many WhatsApp groups, interactive people mm -hmm. who talked about history, especially young, young Great. people, you know, and in different ways. Yeah. So, so we used technologies for storytelling. So um, and did it the, work the only out? problem was, you know, we didn't make any money out of it. So we had, <laughs> we had, a, lot of, we had a lot of experience with that. And, uh, and the other problem is that, um, you know, we, we I think we had a kind of transition now in the market. So, and and in the old times, of course, this was an experiment. Um, but like the public broadcasters should use their platforms and open up them to more this kind of interactive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stuff. You know, they are only a distribution platform. So, yeah. and there are others as well. Yeah. And it's ridiculous. You know, in these times, as we have a lot of also conflicts with, with the old players. We have with the young, uh, you, yeah, with the new players conflicts that they don't want to work together. Okay, we do now a co-production with Netflix and, and CDF, but this is the yeah. very first time yes, yes, you know, starting, yeah, in, starting. in Germany. And, and it's a huge, huge thing for CDF, you know? So, but come on, it's, it's only, <laughs> it's about the content and the film and, and, and how to reach different kind of audiences and, and, and to engage them. Mm -hmm. you know? It's really about educating the platforms to think differently, I guess, right? Well, yeah. uh, politics will have to play a part because I mm. think where they earn money, they should pay taxes or they should invest in the industry. And mm. as soon as that's going to go through, mm. we'll see how interested they are, really. Right. right. Mm. Is there another question? Or yes, Mark's got a question. Anyone else? No? So I just wanted to ask Esther, you, know, you, you were quite down on, on demand. But you know, until 15 years ago, it was on receipt, right? You, we, we got what people gave us. And in an on-demand world, when I hear about these great films I haven't seen, I can go online, I can hunt them down, and I can get to see them. So, and, and of course, along with on-demand, we also have social media, so, you, so people do tell each other about the great stuff they came upon. So why isn't on-demand actually really good for documentary and, and for filmmaking that otherwise might be invisible? It might be, and I might be just wrong. I'm, it might I'm just depend on the platform, though. Hmm? It, which, it might depend on which on-demand platform, right? I, I just think so far, everything that's been online has been for free, especially in non-fiction. Mm. And I'm not saying, you know, it's not just on receipt. It's also, I mean, ratings have been popular for the last 20 years and have been dictating the, the platforms or broadcasters or whatever you want to call them. Uh, appetite for many, many years. So it's not entirely, it used to be the press alone and the, mm -hmm. there's yeah. always been a dialogue with the audience. Mm. I just don't think, or I haven't seen yet a viable way for my filmmakers to actually earn a decent living working with an on-demand distribution partner. I, I think um, when you when you ask people on the street, you want to see a documentary, nobody will say, oh yeah, sure, great. And I said that before. And I, But I really think that when people zap into it, they will stay. I mean, nonfiction is still the strongest viewing magnet for all televisions. And I, I very much believe in this kind of seduction against your will kind of thing that I, I think every film has to draw my audience in and I really hate when films are called important. They can be about an important issue, but a film is entertainment and it has to be gripping. And 
that's where maybe the misunderstanding is with documentaries, because as soon as you call it documentary, a lot of people will think, ooh, that's for school or something. And, and, I, and I think we have a challenge there, and I'm, I'm, I, I really would like to lose all these genres and have actually the, the real ones, like a documentary film noir and a romantic comedy, but the true one. So, <laughs> But it's still not like that. When we talk about documentaries, it's always what is it about? But what about how it's told? It's just simple, entertaining. The biggest compliment I ever got were my teenage kids watching a film that we distributed many years ago that ended up being Oscar nominated and winning all the awards in the world. And I made them watch it, and they didn't want to. And when it was over, they said, but that's not a documentary, Mom. That was a thriller. <laughs> and that's exactly Branding. the point. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. the point. So yeah. I think we can work on demand, but then we'll have to sell ourselves differently. And I don't think the platforms with, with the algorithms are getting the, you know, changing the picture according to who is looking at your lineup. That's, that's not going to cut it. Mm. It's interesting yep. times. You have one more? No, you have oh, one more. Okay, sorry. Who has one more? Okay. Yes, there's one over there. Peter, you have to give it to the audience first. <laughs> <laughs> Peter uh, puts up good <laughs> questions. He does. Um, isn't it that we are living now more in a revolution of distribution than a revolution of uh, content making? Mm -hmm. And if the revolution in the digital transformation is distribution, uh, then what is what, what, what could you, um, all three probably, um, advise to young storytellers to get out and do their stuff and be seen, uh, um, not just as production uh, companies or... Um, helping them in their endeavor, but um, really as a strategy to to not be be lost there in all the the clatter and and noise. Mm -hmm. um, even though you do stuff like, for example, Mats Brugge and doing the the ambassador mm -hmm. uh, or the Red Chapel uh, stuff like that. So um, courageous people do their own kind of um, story endeavor. They they do their documentaries. But how do we make them seen so that people run after them and uh, really consume them and probably pay a little bit too? <laughs> I mean, that, that, yeah, that's one of the reasons why you go to broadcasters, because they have a broadcast footprint and they're going to market it and promote it. And the problem with a, a Netflix is you're promoting to their, their audience, but you probably have a better answer than, than I have. But I mean, it's about visibility, right? About how do you surface it? I don't know how to answer it because it's quite complex. So I, I could say, you know, it, it's a time of production, of production as well, and they create content. There's, there's a huge need now on, on content. Uh, on all platforms, the people want to see more and more. They, mm. don't, they read less books. <laughs> they watch more films now. Mm. Uh, they want to be educated. They want to be entertained. Um, and of course, everything is related. How... I get my audience, so who's my audience first, mm -hmm. you know? And I can't say, you know, I an advice to, to young filmmakers, I, I would say, you know, think about your audience and the, the, and the audiences. They, they could be quite different, so it could be a regional audience, you know, if you, for example, you have huge success with films who dealing only with a, with a region like Bavaria or Berlin or mm -hmm. nightclubs or, you know, this, Things are you have a are you you telling a story for 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 a global audience you know with the cleaners it was for the global audience it's running in ten in ten countries in the cinema it was sold to fifty countries so it's all over the globe because Netflix is everywhere so even China you know bought the film and and um, it's running in the cinemas in China <laughs> um, so or I would say this uh, I don't know uh, it's I made a film about a um, a guy who made billions and he was in the financial world. I made that film because I wanted to persuade him because I was telling his story. He was in prison and with this film he got his reputation back actually. Mm. And I thought he, he will invest then billions in, in distribution, not in, in making films because I think there's enough money um, for, for making films because there's so many great films out there. They are not they cannot be seen because nobody knows that they're so good. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to persuade him to invest billions in these films because that's what these films need. They need the attention. And I think they need big ads um, 
And then it will happen exactly what you are saying. If you, once you see those films, you're just sitting there and you can't believe your eyes. Mm -hmm. I mean... And did he? Is he investing? N not yet. And this Put is him back in prison. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Make> <laughs> him <up> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'll tell that to him. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tragedy. That was the point. Yeah, I think you, you could have a hedge fund actually investing yeah. in films. Yeah. Um, they should. Yeah, but they always say it's not a good business. It's a sexy business, but it's not a yeah, good business. Yeah, but maybe it would be if they would yeah. really do it. Um, I, think, I think times are interesting because, I, I mean, <laughs> a Mass Brugge, for example, he is an absolute crazy talent and, and absolutely amazing. And if more people could see his films, you know, that would be totally cool. But people are so. Everybody's always condemning. Uh, everybody's online all the time. You get all these <laughs> caricatures of people watching their phones. I think it's really interesting. I mean, I never saw so many people read newspapers back then when we still read newspapers. So <laughs> I think it's really people wake up in the morning and on their phone there is uh, the Pope Trump. farted and and Trump uh, tweeted and. You know, I don't know, Theresa May did whatever she's doing. And, <laughs> and of course, um, you look at this and then you've, you're done with the world. But, but you can't escape it anymore either. I mean, people are very hungry for their local news. Uh, I'm also a theatrical distributor in Switzerland. And we passed on a film that is about a street in a city called Lucerne. And I mean, I looked at it and I was like, ah, oh, come on, that's not going to work. And it made a lot of money because everybody in the region went to see it five times wow. or something like that. And, and you like, thought, whoops, that I'll was a mistake. Like, <laughs> Rue de Blamage, yeah, uh, credit where credit's it's due. It's not good. It's not a great film, <laughs> no, but hey, it good. worked. <laughs> um, so, Very so bad. <laughs> everybody's hungry for their own news, and I totally <laughs> get that. So I think we have to find ways. The people mm -hmm. are curious. They're all the time on their phone. So I love that. I think that's a sign of... You know, they're not all just paying Candy Crush or, mm. I don't know, my husband does funny things on his iPad with mm -hmm. colored bullets and stuff. And I, <laughs> I just have no patience for okay. whatsoever in that direction. But there is a, they're on the tools, so we should get them there. I totally agree. Yeah. Peter, do you have one last very quick question? Because um, we have to wrap this I'm, up. I'm very sorry for exceeding that. Uh, but mm. I think uh, it, your question is absolutely right. The revolution is on distribution. I think the answer is a word which we all don't like, it's metadata. When I'm looking on Netflix, Amazon Prime, any mediatek, I have the choice to search for actors, different genres, crime, serial, horror, but there's only one part of it that's called documentaries. And everything with this documentary is inside this, mm -hmm. completely. The second thing is, the recommendation system which is behind that suggest me documentaries according to what fiction I was watching before, mm. which is completely stupid. Yeah. <laughs> but people are, as you said, completely curious. They are watching news, especially in these times, and they need a link between what they are watching in their daily life to the... F I mean, for instance, there is, uh, uh, there is a, a appeasement now in the Gaza Strip with the Hamas. Why not? Where is the link between that news and your film, The Heart of Janine? And my question, and that's why we're coming to what, what we did in the, in the very beginning of that day. Can we influence the kind of algorithm by delivering oh, metadata yeah. or not? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have the answer mm -hmm. to that. But is this what Pete is doing with Alexa? Is this something he's doing by himself, which is collecting all the metadata himself with a huge machine in, in behind? Or is it something we can influence by taking all the metadata out of the production because we know locations, we know people, we know histories, whatever, um, by buzzwords, by, by all this. And can we try to, 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 to find a way that in Netflix it's not only a genre documentaries, but it is much more. And then I think we will bring people to distribution. With, with watching this, this is my idea. It's also about what you were saying, you know, make, make, chop up the genre so there's different bits, so it's not just one big thing for the whole thing, because uh, documentaries go from, I mean, they're all over the place, they're different kinds, right? But there's no distinction out there, really. Like your kid's calling that a thriller, not a documentary. That's a perfect example. 
we need to wrap up. Is there, um, you've been great. I've really enjoyed this, okay? Isn't this a wonderful panel? Yes? <laughs> Enjoy that? All right. So please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. <laughs>